participation in the Nigerian petroleum industry dates back to the early 20th century, when European authorities recognized oil as the fuel of the future and encouraged private businesses to undertake aggressive exploration all over the world. Since then, economic challenges have been mounting in Nigeria, forcing the central bank to introduce currency restrictions to conserve foreign exchange reserves, which have fallen to more than an 11-year low. My name is Peace Hyde, and this is My Worst Day on Forbes Africa TV. The attainment of independence in the 1960s led to intense exploration activities as the nation put in place policies that would lead to major economic and political changes in the oil sector. Deep water fields that first begun production 10 years ago now account for more than half of Nigeria's production. Among the patriarchal owners of these wealthy fields, an unlikely titan emerged. Let's find out who she is. Born in 1951 to the family of Chief L.A. Ogbara in Lagos State, Mrs. Folaronsho Alakija is a Nigerian businesswoman who is the second richest African woman and also the third richest woman of African descent in the world. She is worth an estimated $1.61 billion, according to Forbes. She is a business tycoon involved in fashion, oil, and the printing industries. Mrs. Alakija is the vice chair of Fan for Oil, a Nigerian exploration and production company that has a 60% participating interest in Block OML 127, part of the larger Agmami field. One of Nigeria's largest deep waters discoveries with its partner Chevron and Petrobras. Her first company was a fashion label that catered to Nigeria's elite women. Mrs. Alakija is the group managing director of the Rose of Sharon Group, which consists of the Rose of Sharon Prints and Promotions Limited and Digital Reality Prints Limited. She is also the founder of the Rose of Sharon Foundation, which has a focus on empowering widows and their families, as well as orphans, to be successful through educational programs and scholarships. Mrs. Alakija and her husband also founded the Christian Ministry, the Rose of Sharon Glorious Ministry International. Mrs. Alakija is also a renowned author, having written University of Marriage, Alone with God, her autobiography, Growing with the Hand That Gives the Rose, and The Cry of Widows and Orphans, to name a few. In conjunction with her partners, her company is also a major sponsor of the Agbami Medical and Engineering Scholarship Scheme, one of the most reliable scholarship schemes in Nigeria, with over a thousand people yearly as beneficiaries. Thank you for joining me on My Worst Day on Forbes Africa TV. And today we are joined by an exceptional woman, the iconic Mrs. Folaronsho Alakija. Thank you very much for joining me on My Worst Day. You're most welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, now, first of all, we want to start by finding out who is Miss Folaronsho Alakija? Folaronsho Alakija is a mother, a grandmother, and a wife to my husband of almost 40 years. And uh, God has blessed us with four sons and two grandchildren. Francia Lakija is a businesswoman. She's a philanthropist. And success story that one can talk about now has not been overnight. It's taken well over 30 years in business to get to this point but I give God the glory. Um, now you've had quite a diverse career um, from banking to fashion, um, oil, and then also your printing industry. Um, can you talk us through that journey, please? In fact, I started out as a confidential secretary when uh, I, I came back from England. And I worked with uh, Shijuadi Enterprises for about a year and a half, and then I moved to a bank that was just starting out in Nigeria at the time. And I was there for almost 12 years. But then 
And shortly after that, I realized that uh, more people were being hired and some were being taken above me. And I decided that it was time to move on. So I decided that um, I needed to go and set up my own business. I decided that I was going to go and study fashion design. I believe in doing things properly. I don't like half measures. Anything worth doing at all for a following show is worth doing well. So I decided to go back to England to study fashion design properly and uh, set up my own fashion house, which was called Supreme Stitches at the time. Immediately when I launched my label, I was invited to join, uh, to take part in a fashion competition. And that fashion competition brought me out into the limelight because I won the competition. Somewhere along the line, on an occasion when I traveled to England to go and uh, see my children who were schooling abroad at the time, I met a friend of mine on board who had um, invited me, who had told me that uh, she was uh, involved with uh, uh, a business group that wanted to lift crude in Nigeria. And from that point, I, that was the point where anything about oil came into my life. She wanted me to see whether I could uh, get the company that she was involved with uh, an opportunity to lift crude, Nigerian crude. It was an American company. And I went knocking on a few doors to be able to get me uh, uh, an appointment with the oil minister. Right. And the petroleum minister told me that the government of the day was not really interested in doing that anymore. But that um, there was, that they preferred to get companies to invest in the Nigeria oil industry. I took the message back and they said they didn't want to invest in Nigeria. So they left. And then I thought to myself after that, that well, now that I have a foot in the door, why don't I go back to the oil minister and find out what I can do in that industry? Basically, all that was in my mind was to try and get any kind of contract, just to earn a little bit more than what I was making in my fashion business. Mm -hmm. So I went back, uh, went to see some relatives of mine in NNPC, and uh, they suggested that why don't you go and try for transportation of crude. So I did my homework in that area, I went back to the minister, and uh, he said, well, by the time we s start using, uh, connecting pipelines, more of that, when we start connecting more pipelines, we won't be needing the trucks as much as before. So I felt a bit disappointed again. Um, I went back and I was wondering what else I could do. On another visit, he then suggested to me that uh, because this, that current government at that time was more interested in getting Nigerians involved in exploiting its oil industry rather than having the multinationals continue to cut away the wealth of Nigeria. That uh, why don't I look at uh, oil exploration and production? So I felt rather depressed, dejected, and uh, it seemed as if uh, the final door had been shut in my face. I decided to um, not give up. Foreign Shalakija is not the type of person that gives up easily. Um, I decided to do some more homework. I started looking for technical partners, which I found. And we applied for an oil license. It took three years to get that oil license. And oil ministers changed hands a couple of times. And each time I had to reapply all over again. Then the license eventually came in August 1993. 
to my delight. And it was funny that it took another three years to be able to get a new set of technical partners because the first set of technical partners that we had um, did not want to have anything to do with the kind of block that we were allocated. It was deep offshore. Technology had not reached the water depth of the oil block that we had been allocated, which was about uh, 5,000 feet. So we were going around looking for technical partners that would team up with us and that would be able to um, not only provide the technical know-how, but also provide the, uh, the, the, the funds right. for us to be able to uh, explore and exploit it. After three years, we did get an invitation by Texaco uh, for a meeting. And we negotiated for three months, backwards and forwards. And I can say, to the glory of God, you know, the rest has been history. When you were given that deep offshore oil block and the general consensus was that it was one of the worst, what was going through your mind? How did you feel about acquiring it and taking the risk to actually work on it, not knowing if you would actually, it would bear fruit or not? During the period that, you know, I was trying to get the oil license, I became born again. Okay. And in be becoming born again, I had entered into a covenant with God. And I'd said, if you will bless me, I'll work for you all the, all the days of my life. Right. So I knew that God would not disappoint me. journey, what would you say has been your worst day in business so far? Hmm. How can I ever forget that day? The worst day of my life in business. This was in, I think it was in 1999. When the government of the day decided to back into our oil block by taking 40% of our 60% shareholding, which is two thirds of our ownership. Two thirds of our ownership of something that we had suffered over the years. It, when we initially got into making inquiries in the oil industry from 19, January 1991, to 1999, eight years of our lifetime had passed. All our life savings had been put into it. We had taken a sole risk, meaning that if we did not strike oil and strike it in commercial quantity, we could have been wiped out. We decided to take that risk. And it was after we had discovered oil in commercial quantity that the, that, uh, that the government decided to back into our block and say, okay, now that it's looking juicy, we want a part of that. It wasn't fair. We felt cheated. We went calling and knocking on doors of friends who might be able to help us to salvage the situation. Nobody helped. It seemed as if we had suddenly become the plague. Mm. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with us to the extent that I had friends in high places 
who, when they bumped into me, would look the other way or would hold a newspaper to cover their faces. It was as bad as that. Wow. So now you are here with the government essentially taking away everything you had worked hard for. What was going through your mind? What did you want to do? How did you feel? We felt that we had nothing to lose by fighting back. But we had everything to gain if we won. So we decided to take the government of the day to court. People thought we were crazy. But there was nowhere else to go. Every door had been shut in our face. We were depressed, dejected, upset, angry, but who do you want to punch? Nobody to punch. Uh, it seemed as if it was the end of the world and everything had collapsed in our faces. I mean, this was a family business that become a family business. We were all, you know, working in it. My husband, my children, myself, and short of throwing in the towel and giving up, we decided we, were, we would not do that, that we would take the matter to court. People were think, saying, but you can never win against the government when you go to court. Government always wins. We said, we're, it's going to be fight to finish. We are going to go all the way, whatever it takes. So we started from the lower courts. It took 12 years to get to um, the point of uh, the final judgment at the Supreme Court. It was bittersweet. There were times we would win on some motions. There were times we would lose on some motions in court. And uh, my husband played a fantastic role. He's a lawyer. Throughout that 12 year period, he was in court all the time. And uh, we were paying huge sums to be represented by uh, other lawyers and chambers in various courts. And there were sleepless nights. We were fasting, praying, and it was like we were on our own. Friends, relatives were abusing us, and they were saying things like, oh, so the government took 40%, came back, took another 10%, leaving us with the, just 10% from our 60% shareholding of the entire um, partnership. So is 10% not enough for them? What are they looking for? So abuses everywhere. So that first day, that one day, in retrospect, when we look back, mm -hmm. we thank God for taking that bold step to decide to, to fight back. Mm -hmm. And why did we eventually win? We did, we had signed a, signed a contract at the beginning with the government that they could back into the oil block. But there were steps and processes that needed to be followed, which the government did not do. They were supposed to sit us down and negotiate with us before they could do anything with our block. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to give us compensation for whatever percentage they wanted to take from us. But where they went wrong was they didn't do any of that. And what they did is we gave the license. We have the right to come into any block at any time that we please. And we can take what we want. Meaning they wanted to reap where they didn't really sow because we had paid for the block. 
all the government dues we had paid right from the start. Nigeria has a constitution and nobody, even the government itself is not above the constitution. So it was those arguments that we built on mm -hmm. that got us the, uh, the opportunity to win the, 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 the case. 12 years is a very long time. Was there any point in that process that you felt like just throwing in the towel and giving up or doubting even whether you would come out successful? Giving up was not an option. Fallon Richard does not give up. My husband does not give up. My children do not give up. We were a force that had to be reckoned with. When you think of the worst day, when you found out what the government were trying to do, and you contrast it to the moment you found out that you had actually won the legal battle, how did you feel? On top of the world, elated, um, more uh, closer to God. I decided that I was going to develop an even deeper relationship with him within that 12 year period. We had learned that man will deceive you, man will disappoint you, man will reject you, man will turn their backs on you. But God would always be standing. And also there's a lot of young entrepreneurs, young business people that are looking up to you. Your story is extremely inspiring. Um, what would be your advice to them in, for young people who are looking to venture into uncharted territories um, and see how successful they can become? What would be your advice to them? What I would say is there's no industry or sector that's the exclusive preserve of any gender. Make sure that you do your homework. Make sure that you look for mentors. Make sure that you acquire the requisite skills to enable you to succeed in your chosen venture. Never take no for an answer. I didn't take no for an answer. I never will take no for an answer. And for me, there's no such word as can't. One of the very first things that one should do is always to ask God first. To ask God where he wants you to be. What he has planned for your destiny. And I believe that if you do that, against all odds, no matter what may be thrown at you, you will still be standing the way I'm standing today, to God's glory. Absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so very much for joining us on My Worst Day, Mrs. Alakija. You've been absolutely amazing. Thank you very much, it's been my pleasure. Well, there you have it. You've heard from the visionary herself about her journey through her worst day as an entrepreneur. Now, let's find out what her closest allies had to say about this phenomenal woman. My name is Mrs. Tokwe Olushola. I'm the secretary to the Rose of Sharon Glorious Ministries International, and I'm also a member of the Board of Trustees for the Rose of Sharon Foundation. My name is Elsie Akiande Shola. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Digital Reality Print Limited. Hi, my name is Dele Alakaja. I'm former Shola Alakaja's son. Um, I've known Mrs. Alakaja for over 10 years. 26 years. Um, Mrs. Alakaja, my mom, she's... Um, hmm. Mrs. Alakaja is very passionate. Um, Mrs. Alakaja is a, a consummate woman. Focused and very enterprising. She's energetic, she's very, very business focused. When she sets her sights on something, she does not allow anything to distract her until she achieves her goal. Um, but I think one of the things that surprises me the most is how much of a workaholic she is. She's really passionate and she's driven. She never considers anything as impossible. I mean, she literally spends all her time on one form of project or another. I find it, I don't, I don't know where she finds the time. You know, someone who is always very focused on everything that she does. She's a go-getter. So if she has to move mountains to get to her objective, trust me, she would. You know, even sometimes when you come up with ideas or reasons why things can't work, she doesn't agree with you. She sees how things can work. I guess that's why she's achieved so much. Passion is a thing of the heart. If she feels something is right, either from an ethical, social, or spiritual point of view, she fights for it. And she's forgiving 
and she's very prayerful. And she's someone I see as a, she, who genuinely tries to follow what she believes Christ is all about. That, those are the qualities that I see in her and that I really admire in her and I try to follow. She's, she's really a lovely person. Um, but she's also, my, she's also my mother at the end of the day. It's, it's actually kind of amazing. We really are proud of her in this position and uh, we hope that it inspires others, um, not just in Nigeria but throughout Africa, to try to emulate uh, the type of person that she is to, to give and to help others and to touch people's lives. It is often said failure is hard, but success is far more dangerous. Everything you want as an entrepreneur is on the other side of fear. Those who achieve success are those who venture into uncharted waters, often with no life jacket, ready to sink or swim. Which one of these entrepreneurs are you? My name is Peace Hyde and this is my worst day on Forbes Africa TV.